for being a blessing to the world. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Welcome to the Lighthouse Center for Spiritual Living, where we are here to remember the magnificent truth that we are one, that we are one with each other, we are one with everything that is happening on this planet, and we are one with everything that is transcending beyond our planet, that there is no limit to this oneness. There is no other, right? So it's good to be with all of you on this wonderful morning. Thank you, Jack, for being here as always. Thank you, tech team, fantastic. We wanna give thanks, Peggy uh, Berger, our, our prayer team member, set our beautiful remembrance table up for this morning. Let's give Peggy a little love. She just jumped right on in there. Thank you for jumping right in. And uh, so these are our beautiful pictures of people that we remember, and I know some of you did not bring pictures today. That doesn't matter, because we're, there, we're holding them in our heart. And these are, there's no time limit. There's no time. So anyone who has gone to the other side of the veil, they're with us today. So let us be present to that awareness that these souls are always with us. To those of you online, you are invited to have pictures, if you would like, and a little candle by the people that you are remembering, the people that you are calling forth in this beautiful, I love this Sunday, this, love the service, we do this every year, and I just love the feeling tone of it. So thank you for being here, thank you for participating online. It's gonna be a magnificent morning. Jack, is there anything you would like to say about the music today? We're just remembering everyone. We're remembering everyone. And so let's just, we're, this is going to be very brief. It's not as long, but just a quick internal intention with your remembering. Just close your eyes. A quick check-in with your heart and those who you are bringing forth in your memory today. And we know that this memory is alive and activated in all of us, this wonderful consciousness. And even as we are remembering our individual loved ones, we include all beings in our remembering, that we are one with all beings that have ever existed beyond time and space and in time and space. For that is who we truly are. In deep abiding gratitude, we just let it be. So it is. Amen. So it is. Amen. Let it be. It's really what our whole spiritual journey is about. It's just letting everything go. What's left when we let everything go? The purity of spirit. That spirit's love is all that there is, as ever at will be, and is right now. There's nothing we can do, nothing that we can ever do on any level that's going to add to the love that is right here in this moment. And so the entire spiritual journey is to, it's about the layers and the layers of letting go and letting go and letting go to allow ourselves to be that transparency of pure love and pure light. We don't have to do anything we just get to be and allow that light to shine as each and every one of us. We might notice on the spiritual journey that there's a lot of metaphors of death and rebirth. So we have December coming up, that's a lot about the birthing the light in the midst of the darkness. Then we have new year, new life, new year. Then we have spring, which is all about new life. I mean, it just keeps coming up. Death, rebirth, death and rebirth. Because it's so essential and inherent on our spiritual journey to let go, to let go, to let go, and to be in that light. When I, that was probably one of my beautiful gifts when I had the aneurysm. The great thing about the particular part of the brain that it hit was it was the language part of me. So the, my, 
it didn't all go away at once. In fact, I had it for two weeks, so it didn't go all the way at once, but it was just slowing down <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> and then finally, when I was in the doctor's office, but this is beforehand, I just thought I needed a massage or something. I didn't realize it was so serious. And so when I was in um, urgent care, and then he, and we're just getting along just fine. In fact, just a side note, we were doing World's Religions at the time, and I had been trying to track this very, this very guy to come and speak about Islam, and I could never get in touch with him because he was so busy, but he was my doctor. He showed up there. <laughs> Isn't that great? So we were just having this wonderful conversation, and Diane Pollard, who took me there, told me later, she told him when they were outside the office, she said, because he, he's thinking I'm fine, and she's like, no, she talks a lot faster than that, because <laughs> I was talking quite slowly. And then, but then he came back and he was pale because he was reading a CAT scan. And he's like, uh, no, this is a problem. But my thoughts had stopped so slowly. And what happens when our thoughts start slowing down is we are just consciousness. And so I suddenly was witnessing in him and the other people, and then Jack and Julian came, fear. Like, I felt zero fear because my verbal skill, <laughs> my verbal part of my brain was not working to create fear. And I've wondered that because I've listened to other people who've had, who, there's different types of strokes, but um, this is more one uh, from childhood. It was a slow bleeding one. And that people talk about it with so, sort of a dispassion. And like I said, they're all different, completely different. But there's that one that slows down the brain. And when the brain is slowing down and you're just in your consciousness, I just, it was bizarre. I just was feeling so much joy and I was looking at them in so much joy and I could see their fear and I felt none of it because I didn't have the capacity to think about fear or to create a story of what this all means. I knew I was fine because I was consciousness. The only time I came, and I sort of stayed in that presence the whole time other than one time and it was right before surgery. I guess they have to do this legally. The surgeon came in and told me I had about 10% chance to live. That's when I sort of get like, wait, what? <laughs> but then I went back because I'm like, well, I can't do anything about that. <laughs> my, mind, my mind couldn't even perseverate on that or go on and on because it wasn't working. So I just go, oh, that's, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> just pop back into consciousness. <laughs> And it's such a reminder for me. I constantly have to remind myself, oh, that's right. This freedom, this freedom, because so much about letting go and going into the light is about freedom, is always present for us. And the thing, as you'll also know, because you all have been on the spiritual journey, the thing that blocks us from that freedom, blocks us from the light, are all of our attachments and resistances. So we hear that all the time. What are you attached to? What are you resisting? This past week, we've been having this autobiography of a yogi book club that meets on Tuesdays. And this past week, the reading for this Tuesday, one of the chapters is chapter 27. And it's when he starts a school at, in India, Yogananda starts a school. And um, he has this experience. So they have 25 acres of land. He's, it's a school for young boys. And they have 25 acres of land. He loves being outside. And there's this little fawn that they have a lot of animals, but at, the kids just fell in love with this little baby deer. And Yogananda did too, so he let the baby deer sleep in his room because he thought he was so cute. And he said, in the morning, he comes wobbling over for a little pet. And then he had to be out of town, Yogananda. So he um, instructed the kids not to overfeed the fawn, but of course, there was always that one kid. <laughs> and he got the fawn, so by the time Yogananda came back, he was severely ill from overfeeding. And all the kids were incredibly upset. Yogananda was upset. So he's just holding this fawn and praying and praying from that incredible consciousness that he is who, to heal this little baby fawn. And in the morning, the, the baby fawn gets up and sort of wobbles. And they're like, oh, he's living. He's out of his coma and he's living and yay. And so Yogananda was with him throughout the day and kept stayed up with him until about 2 AM. And then he fell asleep. And when he went to sleep, he had um, a dream where the fawn came to him. And the fawn said to him, you're holding me back. Let me go. I thought that was so, I thought the wording was so good. Not just let me go, but you're holding me back. Let me go. Give me freedom. I can't evolve 
as long as you're holding Rian, because what the Fawn was saying also said, as Yogananda understood it, was if I will stay here, if you keep praying for me, it will work. I will stay here, but I'm no longer fully healthy. I'm ready to go, and I don't want to be kept here. Stop holding me here. I won't leave without your permission, but stop holding me here. That's what attachment does. It keeps, sometimes we think it shows up as love, but sometimes it's, it's almost keeping the people that we love constricted. You know, a little bit like, I can't move on. And it's so interesting because in that same chapter, he has another story, almost exactly the same, but with a spiritually enlightened teacher, Prajnamanabada. <laughs> I, I had it down and then I forgot, sorry. But a really cool name. It's actually not that hard, it's just long. And he's a Swami, and he's ready to go. And again, Yogananda's like, don't go. He's like, I'm kicking the bucket. <laughs> he's like, no. And he said, don't be selfish, Yogananda. You know, I've done my job here. I have stuff to do. And he knew, he, because he was enlightened, he knew what he had to do. And you keep that, it's not nice or loving of you to keep me here, because I got stuff to do. Let me go. So I thought it was so interesting in both of those stories in the same chapter it was about letting go, letting go of the people that we love as an act of love. That the act of love was not holding on. The act of love was not doing all of our work to make sure they're here. And Yogananda had to be able to hear that message too. He had to be willing to hear the message of let me go. Because his attachment, he loved that little fawn. So it's easier to let go when we know that there's light on the other end. And so we know that this letting go is happening not just when people pass on to the other side, but it's happening all through our life. We're letting go of jobs, letting go of relationships. It can be extremely painful. I mean, I'm talking about letting go like it's all easy and breezy, but there can be deep pain with letting go. If you're attached to a relationship and you're feeling really connected and the other person's like saying, no, it's, this isn't, I'm, I feel complete on my end. No, wait, come back. You know, I'm not done yet. I, this, this thing pulls me from my core, like no. Or a job that just gave you so much fulfillment and, and, and it might not even be personal, it might just be layoffs. But suddenly I don't have a job, I'm, I'm let go. It is painful and it hurts. And the biggest reason why it's painful and it hurts is because we feel like we're losing something. And so what the spiritual work is, is to realize that we're never losing anything when we let go. That's easy to say, I know. And so all that when we're, so that's why I'm saying it's a spiritual journey and why it keeps coming up. And every year it's so cyclical because there's always stuff that we're holding. There's layers. There's layers of attachment, layers of things like I just can't be without this or I will, I, I will be less than. I will, I will, have, I will be subtracted from. That, that there's something that I had with this relationship, this job, this whatever, this lifestyle, this state, if you move, this, that I had that I will no longer have. I am now missing something. That's what we're healing because we're never ever going to be missing anything in spirit. It's all already within us and that's such profound work. And we're not going to do all that work today, but that's just a recognition of when we say letting go that it is deep work to be able to trust so completely that in consciousness and in this light and love we have everything that we need, including that continual relationship with those who are on another side of the veil. I was listening this past week to uh, We Can Do Hard Things, and they had a, a guest on, Martha Beck. It's a great episode. Actually, I'll be talking a little bit more about it next week. But one of the things she said at the very, very end was she was talking about her son, Adam, who was, has Down syndrome. And at first she pointed out, you know, I had an, she had had a near-death experience where she experienced freedom from everything other than love, like everything just dropped away and there was only love. And we see that with so many near-death experiences. So she, so she was picking up her son, Adam, from his best friend's mother had 
a funeral, and so she's picking him up from the funeral. And she was saying, you know, it's okay to be sad because these are hard things. And he said, yeah, but it makes it easier when the light comes. And she sort of stops. She goes, oh, you've experienced the light. And he goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> she goes, oh, when? He goes, yeah, it just came and touched my heart. She goes, when, when? When did this happen? And he said, back when I was 13 years old on May 10th. <laughs> The light came and touched my heart. And he goes, when, you, when it touches your heart, it makes things easier. And she said, right, that's so true. And she said, it's amazing because even though we can't see it all the time, it's always here and we can always lean onto it. And Adam says, oh, no, I see it all the time. <laughs> and she goes, you do? And he goes, yeah. She goes, do you see it now? Yeah. She goes, well, where is it? Is it like on the ceiling? Is it in your heart? Where, where, what, what are you seeing? Where are you seeing? He goes, mom, it's everywhere. <laughs> It's everywhere. When we have the eyes to see, he was so innocent. Once he was touched by light, it just stayed. That light is everywhere. It's real. And so the things that we need to work through, the flaws. You know, everyone on this table, you know what they all have in common? They have flaws. <laughs> My parents have flaws. We all have flaws. We all have flaws. But those flaws are part of our temporary story. Our eternal story is that we are flawless, that we are full of light. And so what happens is when we let go of the shoulds and the shouldn'ts, and we do our work, and all, this, all of the work that we're doing all the time, all the spiritual work, it's all about letting things go. It's all about, let, you're not, we're not going to get to peace until we can let go. And sometimes we can't let go. There's stuff we have to work through. We are human beings. It's absolutely vital that we acknowledge that we're human beings and these different flaws can hurt us and, and shape us and have an impact on us. And the eternality of all of these souls is pure love always has been and always will be. And we want to have the eyes like Adam to be able to see with that pure heart of light that every one of these souls were, may have, like, like us, have these human limitations, but spiritually that's who they are. And so when we get to the point, and, it's, and often it takes layers where we can just let those things go, be in a forgive, that's power of forgiveness, forgive, not shallow, superficial give because I'm supposed to forgive. I mean deep, authentic, letting go. Just letting go, letting them be human. And yes, they had their flaws, but when we let that go, we can finally see who they really are. And, and I'm saying this sort of in a linear way, like finally see, you probably have seen, obviously they're here, they're here. You've known who they really are all along or they wouldn't be your loved ones but we get to even feel and see them more deeply. Because what happens, you all have heard this, if you love something, set it free, and if it's yours, it'll come back to you. I learned that when I was in high school, my first relationship. <laughs> set it free, and if he's really yours, he'll come back. But what it, what it really is, is when we let it go, when we let all that stuff go, when we let all this about ourselves too, that's really actually what we're really doing when we're healing other people is really ourselves. It all comes back to that. If we're holding on to someone else and their stuff, that means we're holding on to our stuff. Letting go. And the more we let go, and the more we let go, and the more we let go, and we get into that true self, the exact opposite happens. We become more intimate. We're not getting to a place of, oh, I don't care. I'm letting them go because I'm just sort of detached and I just have no feelings. I love one of the things I heard a spiritual teacher say is actually the more we let go, the more free we become, we actually cry more and laugh more. We feel more because we have the freedom to feel. We're not afraid of our emotions are going to trap us. Sometimes we're afraid we're gonna, these emotions are gonna own us, but when you know the emotions can't own you, they're just flowing through, they come through and like a little, a little tsunami, and you let them move through, and then, then you're back at peace again. When we let people go, the stuff go, we are touching the infinite spirit. We're one, right? That's what we say all the time. Well, we actually get to experience that intimacy and oneness when we let go. We get closer, not further away. We get more connected, more intimate when we let go.
It's that wonderful paradox that we've been talking about all month. When we let go, we become closer. So this morning, we're going to just do a little ritual. And I want to talk for a moment about ritual. I did not grow up in a family that did ritual. When I went to Agape, which uh, is in Los Angeles, it was Reverend Michael Beckwith's community, although he always said he wanted to separate its agape, which is a community unto itself. They loved ritual there. So I was very uncomfortable when I went there because everything was a ritual, a birthday. Let's do a ritual of, and they do the whole thing. And, and sometimes people would just do it with so much, it would, it would just freak me out. Like, you have to like have the secret handshake, jump up and down, do the hokey pokey. I mean, it was just like a lot of stuff you had to remember. And then people were asking me to create it. I'm like, this is so, like I have to come up with all these intricate things. And, and then Reverend Michael taught me about what, what makes a ritual powerful. What makes a ritual powerful is not all the hokey pokey secret handshake things. What makes a ritual powerful is presence. It's when a group of people come together with a collective intention and to be fully present with our intention. So this morning we're coming together in presence that right now, online as well, that we're coming together collectively with this in collective intention to remember our loved ones. So the, the ritual is going to be very simple. I'm just going to take you in for a little bit. Then you're going to, I'm going to invite you to come up. And these are, it doesn't matter if you have pictures up here or not. It's whoever you're holding in your heart. I want tech people to do it as well. Um, and just come up and light a candle. You'll come up and light a candle and sit down. That's our ritual. It is not complicated. It is simple. But what brings it meaning is the presence with which we participate in this. Are you with me on this? Yes. So are we in a collective agreement that we are here today collectively to remember those loved ones who are on the other side of the veil, to remember them and as we remember our own, we know the people that we're doing this with are all doing the same thing and that we are calling forth this wonderful energy of remembering. Are we in an in agreement that this is what we're here for? Online, we know we're with you. We know we can't see you, but we feel you in our hearts. So let's just close our eyes now. And the reason why we like to close our eyes is because the infinite is, our eyes can limit us. Our two eyes can be limiting, so we want to open to that inner, inner knowing that is unlimited, that is beyond the visual. And let's just be fully present to this light and this love that is already here that we can never add on to or we can never take away from. It's all fully as us. And we do this by letting go. So I invite you to take three, at your own pace, three deep cleansing breaths with the intention of just letting everything go any attachments, judgments, resistances, let it all go and to be fully present now. And into this presence, I invite us to call forth the loved one or loved ones we came to remember today. Please call them forth in your awareness in this letting go energy. And as you're calling them forth, I'm just asking you to feel 
feel your connection with them. Let go of the words. Let go of the stuff. And just be with them. Be in their presence and let them be in your presence. You may feel the energy in your heart expanding. Let it expand. Keep breathing. And just this is enough. I'm going to invite some words now, but you don't have to participate in the words unless it comes naturally. Don't force anything. If it comes naturally, I invite you now to share from your heart words of gratitude for your loved one. And again, do not force anything, but if you can hear any communication back, be willing to receive. Feeling the gratitude, the light and the love in this presence. And we give thanks for all of these wonderful beings of love that are joining us here in this room, online, that it, love does know, knows no death. And love is right here in this room, activated as our loved ones. And so what I'm going to invite us to do is Jack will begin to play music. And I'm going to invite you to come forward and to light a candle in memory of the eternal light that these loved ones are in your heart. And memory and celebration and aliveness that each of these loved ones are in our hearts. And while you're waiting for your turn, just stay inward and stay connected in this presence. We're in this together. So everyone lighting a candle is all of us lighting a candle. This is whether you brought a picture or not. This is for everyone in the room. I will remember you. Will you? Let 
your life pass you by hold on to the memories love is a gift we receive each day from the people that we meet along the way I am not the same from what you've given to me Always and forever you will be with me I will remember you Will you remember me? Don't let your life pass you by Hold on to the memories We are on this journey for not too long But this continues on and on and on and on and on So you know, I'll carry you You'll carry me in each other's hearts. We will always be. So I will remember you. Will you remember me? Don't let your life pass you by. Hold on to the memories I will remember you Will you remember me? Don't let your life pass you by Hold on to I will remember you I will remember you I will remember you And how grateful I am to join with this beautiful community of remembering that we are all one in our remembering. There's so much overflowing love of this remembering. It calls and activates these wonderful loved ones, these beautiful, powerful loved ones for all eternity in our souls, in our hearts. We give thanks, we give thanks, we give thanks for the power of oneness where there is never separation. And today we know that. We know that we know. Love knows no death. And as we know this here in this room and online, in this particular ritual, we include the entire world. We see a world of suffering through attachment and through resistance, not just in our friends and our family, but collectively countries and nations at war with each other over attachments and resistances. And today, we just open our hearts and invite freedom, a letting go, a letting go to the extent that anyone, everyone on this planet can just step just a little bit forward into that letting go, just a little baby step into that letting go, to remember, to remember that all of us have everything that we need all of the time, that this love is eternal and never diminishes, that it is fully in our hearts for all eternity. This is what we remember for all sentient life form forever. So in deep and abiding gratitude for our loved ones who help us to remember and to know who and what we really are and for the gifts that we have received from our loved ones and that we continue to express their gifts in our world today. As we go out into our world, we know that they are inhabiting us acting as us, talking through us, their gifts and their talents expressed through each of us.
for the eternality and the infinite connection, I just say thank you. Thank you, God. And when we remember to remember as we have today, we remember not only is there peace, not only is there love, there is infinite joy. There is a lightness of being. As we heard in the reading today, light, light, and more light. And this is what we know and accept here and now in the honoring and the loving and the remembering of our loved ones. We are swimming, radiating, pulsating as this infinite oceanic light. In deep abiding gratitude for this lighthouse community, I just say thank you, thank you God. We release this word now, we completely let it be. This time together, we let it all be. And in that let go, we say together, and so, so it, it is. is. Amen and amen. I walk in God in all I do. I walk in God in all.